My name is Josh Foster. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I've been able to grace the stages uh, with such as Tyler Perry, Snoop Dogg, Mariah Carey, Stella Awards, the Black Music Honors, Urban One Awards, and uh, now working with Renee Rapp. A lot of this industry that hopefully some people will start to recognize, I, I talk about this a lot, but character. I know that skill got me in the door uh, for people to know of me. However, I think that after that, um, character uh, has kept me in those doors.
That was Josh Foster, and this is the drummer's hot seat. <laughs> My name is Josh Foster. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, born in Waco, Texas, raised in Fort Worth, Texas. DF Dub, that's home. Uh, man, I've been able to grace the stages uh, with such Tyler Perry, Snoop Dogg, Mariah Carey. Um, currently, the Stella Awards, the Black Music Honors, Urban One Awards, <laughs> and uh, now working with Renee Rapp. Um, and so, yeah, man, I'm. I mean, that's to name a few, but I'm I'm, I'm extremely yeah. blessed to be here yeah. and honored that you would have me come, bro. For sure, bro. I had to. I had to. Listening to your resume, bro, you had all types of crazy names on there. It's absolutely insane. Thank Could you, you like, man. you know, I wanted to know as a drummer. Yeah. I know I probably won't ever be where you are in terms of the people you play with, but how did you get those gigs? Ah. If you that's don't good. mind me asking. Yeah. Um. I would say, man, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of this industry that hopefully some people will start to recognize, I, I talk about this a lot, but character. Mm. I would say character. Um, I know that skill got me in the door right. uh, for people to know of me. Um, obviously, like this is craft is number one. Like you have to be able to play. Um, however, I think that after that um, character uh, has kept me in those doors. Um, one quote I definitely want to say on here, I say it every time I remember and get a chance to say it, but by Rick Watford, amazing guitar player, yeah, um, uh, producer, um, has played on several records and we work together often with uh, Daniel Moore, with the, with the band for the Stellars and for the honors. And one thing Rick Watford says that I love, and uh, for y'all to remember this, you have three versions of your reputation, mm. right? The first part uh, is, <clears throat> Uh, when you walk in the door, your reputation is behind you, right? Right. Um, and that's when you haven't established enough yet. Right. So people kind of know of you um, and you come in and people are kind of getting to know you a little bit, right? The second time you walk in with your reputation, right? Yeah. So now more people have heard of you. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of in the know, but it, now when you come in, you, you're setting that precedent. But the third one is when your <coughs> reputation proceeds you. And, and I feel like for me, a lot of my career, uh, when I first moved to Atlanta in 2017, for those of you who don't know, mm -hmm. a lot of what I was doing was setting up a foundation for my name. And that's what we're all doing. Right, right. And I think a lot of the gigs, the gigs come once you've established like this is what I do. This is who I am. Um, and the character and the craft line up. You know what I mean? Thanks. So I think that that's been my motto. It's like, you know, and I tell anybody that when you first come in the door, we don't know who you are. Right. Uh, they didn't know who I was. You know, my first award show was 2019, the, my first Black Music Honors. Really? Um, and after that, before that, Daniel Moore, the MD for the honors, all the award shows I do, and Mariah Carey, right. that who we work with together. Um, he, we met from the Tyler Perry play. So uh, for me, it was a whirlwind of relationships that happened from the Tyler Perry tour. So you play with him in all these shows. So before, after the Tyler Perry tour is when me and Daniel Moore started working. Gotcha. But first I would give a shout out to Ronnie Garrett, who was the MD for Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. He put me on uh, with, uh, with the play. Gotcha. And before that, uh, shout out to D Major, Boyton, uh, Donnie, Donnie <clears throat> Boyden, um, amazing keyboard player, producer um, here in Atlanta. And uh, he put me on with the Snoop Dogg play. And then around that time, I had already met Ronnie. Mm -hmm. And then man, from there, from Ronnie, then I meet Daniel Moore. And then now with Renee Rapp, Terrence Vaughn, who's, who's amazing, you know, uh, awesome. musical director, programmer, arranger. And I think from everybody, the main thing people would say Yes, they're going to say I can play, but what they're going to tell you, I feel and believe mm -hmm. is that I'm a, I'm my character. Mm -hmm. Like they enjoy having me around. Yeah, most definitely. And I, and I think that that's what, what it is at the, at this level of the game, because after a while, everyone's killing, right. you know, the For music sure. game is like the NBA. Like after a while, everybody can dunk as Ronnie Garrett would say, <laughs> is like everybody can dunk. So, Thanks. so what else do you have to offer? Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like 
for me, it's it's the quality of relationship, the quality of friendship, the quality of brotherhood. Um, so yeah, that's I would say those have been the things that have allowed me in the room, but kept me in the room. Mm. I can vouch for it too, cause he's only I've only seen him for like what two hours, <laughs> and he's a cool guy, man. <laughs> I could definitely say that. So, um, speaking about all these, you know, great people you played for, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. what's the what's the favorite tour you've been on? That might be a hard one. <laughs> That's tough, bro. Yeah, they all have their own thing, man. Yeah, That's down. so tough. All types of different. Uh. I I don't know if I would use the word favorite. Okay. I might use the word. Uh, I I have to because I you know lately like with Mariah we do the Christmas tour mm -hmm. and those are fun like right, those right. are amazing. Mm -hmm. But I, I I would say the introduction for me to touring was with Tyler Perry. It was with okay. outside of the Snoop Dogg tour, the first full length tour, mm -hmm. and. It wasn't just about the music. It was, for me, it's the it's the brotherhood, the sisterhood. Cause in that band, um, in the in the Tyler Perry play, we had Natalie Reagans on um, uh, Oxen organ and, and mains, and then Patrick Wright, my brother from DFW, he also played the opposite. So whatever song Nat didn't play mains on, he did. Uh, especially like with Tam Laman stuff. My brother Dominic Sanchez on guitar, who's still like one of my best friends today. Um, of course, Ronnie Garrett, Indian on bass, uh, uh, Darius Fentress on percussion, and who am I missing? On horns, we had uh, Jamel Mitchell on tenor. He, I think he might have did some alto stuff, or I know he did alto, tenor, and I want to say Barry on some stuff too, but it might have just been alto and tenor. I could be wrong, but Jamel Mitchell, uh, Melvin Jones on trumpet. Um, and mellophone, yeah, and trombone, uh, Will Will Williams. Um, yeah. So it was a brotherhood. Yeah, it just like, felt good to be yeah. around people you liked. Yeah, I think that was the introduction to touring. That was the introduction to uh, being consistent, showing up every day, okay. being on it. We did 151 shows. Oh my goodness! And so that was one of my favorite tours, but. I, the other tours have been fun too. Like I just did a tour with Renee Rap, and that and that's such a family. But I think I would say if I had a favorite, it's just because that was the introduction to it. But yeah, like I can't really say I have like like this is the only tour I enjoy. I like you know what I mean? They all have their own things. Because even with the Mariah Squad, we play Spades, yeah. and you know when I got in, it was shaky for me because like yeah. I kind of play Spades, but not really. And anybody who knows Daniel Moore. Man, um, he's an ultimate competitor, so you know we we. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they all have their family own family bonding. Man. Nah, that's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. All right, we're gonna get into. Uh, we you had before this segment. If y'all haven't seen it, we did a Phil versus Flash where he talked about. You know, Josh is kind of known for that. You know, before I, I've seen a whole bunch of Phil vs. Flash <laughs> videos, and that's probably how I got into you, I think. Okay. Yeah, I've seen a lot of your okay. Phil vs. Flash videos, and that's how I've seen it. So, anyway, this guy called Devontae Clark, I don't know if you know him. Yeah. Sonic the Drummer, yeah. yeah. He had <clears throat> a video that was kind of, it's kind of similar to Phil vs. Flash. His was like, uh, what was it called? It was like Shedding versus Being Musical. Yes. Yeah, y'all probably see it, but it's not out right now. Like right now, it's coming out tomorrow. Gotcha. But he brought you up in the video because he talked a little bit. Wow. Okay. And he was talking about musicians that know how to be musical and know when it's time to shed. Shout out to all the cats out there that understand music and that are super musical. Um, I should call them uh, Josh Fosters. <laughs> Shout out to all the Josh Fosters and and Devin Taylors and you yeah. know, because obviously shed chops are different from, yeah. you know, right. the chops you do with the shows Absolutely. and everything. So how do you know when to be musical and when to, you know, yeah. bring it out? Yeah, no, this is good. Um, which also too, I'm, I'm pubbing it again because you're allowing me to and I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Fill Over Flash, uh, oh, yeah. Drum Course by Josh Walters coming out soon, yes, sir, shameless yes, plug. Yes, uh, however, yeah, I think this is a really good topic because yeah, there are certain things that I, I wouldn't play in certain settings. I think af after a while, the the songs sold records. Mm -hmm. 
And Daniel Moore would say this all the time. He says this all the time with Mariah specifically when we work with her. Like uh, when we're playing like Shake It Off and these different songs, yeah. like nobody cares yeah. that I could play Mad Chops right. over that song, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. But it's about locking into to what it is for that specific thing. And I think that knowing when is to really is to really recognize what what's intentional about these moments while i'm playing what purpose does it actually serve right i talked about in the fill over flash segment about drums being energy and a lot of the times for these shows the drums outside of you playing the part drums are there to get people more hype right nice. like the fills on the toms exactly. like all of that types of things like this is all energy yeah the boom all that. yeah all of that so it gets people like ready to go and i think a lot with with the shows that i do all that i'm trying to do is either grow the song take it take it on a on a wave to where people can can feel something in it and have an emotional connection to it even if they can't put a a, a word to it right gotcha. but i think that a lot of my playing most of the time yeah bro like i feel like it's really determined by the message of the song there's certain ballads and sad songs and different things that are talking about some really deep emotions. Well, I don't play happy chops, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, on songs that are talking about heartbreak. Right. If anything, like my setups and what I would do for that moment are to that emotion, to that message. But I think for people walking away from this, if if you're playing what's needed for the message of the song, then you're doing it justice. Right. And so even your chops that you bring in, if those apply to that message, like for me, I'm not just playing drums like I can sing the lyrics to the songs. I know the verses. I know the choruses. Um, and for some, I know some of the songs better than others, word for word. But I think that it allows for me to make my placement choices way better because I know what's being said. Right. Because right? when people come, they want to know what's being said. Yeah. That's you know, good. So that's what's up. What about from like a church perspective? Uh, yeah, because let's say um, you have a solo, right? Mm -hmm. A church uh, drum solo for like a gospel song. Right. How would you approach it? Depends on the music. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it still depends on the music. I think sometimes at church, like I think, and I've been wanting to say this, and I hadn't had a moment to. I think sometimes people treat church as like a separate thing professionally. I don't think that mm. people look at church as a opportunity to be excellent, mm. if I be honest. Yeah. I, I don't show up to any setting without the mindset of, of excellence. There's no way for, and, and, and I have to thank my dad for this because that's where all of this starts. Um, and both my parents, but specifically musically, my mm. dad, Nero Foster, um, bass player, but he, he plays everything, drums, bass, guitar. Yes, the biggest thing I would always think about from him, from when we would go to churches, we would do uh, musicals. We would do uh, late services. We would have, we were part of this churches and covenants back home. So we did a lot of services. And the one thing I can always say about my father is no matter the circumstances of any service or what was happening, what we did was exude excellence no matter what. So it's, it's, it's tough for me to turn that switch off. And when people don't bring that same energy towards a thing it it kind of ticks me off a little bit because i i feel like even like if i'm going for it if i'm chopping on a song even though it's in a gospel setting or at church it was still intentional to that moment but i came with that energy and i think you know for me i play in any setting as if this would be the last time i would get to play yeah that's awesome like if that's this good. was the last time people heard me play on drumble that what did i do that was giving my all in that moment mm -hmm. you know what i mean so yeah that's amazing you grew up in church right yeah. like you started playing Absolutely. drums in the church for Absolutely. how long did you do that so i started playing around two years old uh, my grandmother was telling me the other day like i started mouthing beats at nine months old like wow trying to get sounds out but two years old start playing five years old i was playing every sunday morning i was the main drummer at my grandmother's at church five. with my dad that's crazy so my dad was on keys and key bass and i'm playing drums and uh so that's where it starts you know five years old and i'm i'm getting yelled at like i'm 22. <laughs> you know like so I, that was something i grew up with mm. um and it led to all of now what I, you know, what what I've had to deal with, you right. know, in any playing setting. 
But um, I think that that has a heavy influence on me today. Yeah. So around what age would you say you started to branch out, like go out there a lot more? 12. You started to know your name. 12 years old? 12 years old is when I started gigging professionally with my dad and uncles. Um, he had this band called Common Ground. Okay. And uh, that was with uh, my uncle Jermaine Marshall or XL Amos, depending on who was playing or both would play. My uncle Fred Sandifer on um, on guitar, my dad on bass, uh, John Taylor on saxophone, um, and there was you know different variations, different people that would fill in, but that was like the core unit, and then myself on drums. And um, yeah, man, that that was around twelve is when it really started moving. I did clubs, I was playing, so a lot of the stuff that now like people are doing the playing in clubs around, like I had a, a, a early experience with that you know, to really establish okay. my vocabulary. That's awesome. How old are you right now? I am 28. I'm 28, 28 years, years old. old. No, I don't, I don't mind saying <laughs> it. I be thinking about it sometimes. I'm like, man, I'm about to, I'm close to 30, but I'm 28. That's awesome. Hey, yeah. that's, that's crazy. I'm not, I'm not the young, I'm not the youngest guy. Anymore. No, you still young. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what age would you say um, you had your first big gig with the big artist or something, you know, artist. whether I, it's gospel or yeah. you know, secular. My first, because I would say, you know, when I was at Berkeley, I, I got to play. Oh, you was at Berkeley? I, yeah, I went to Berkeley. Wow, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. For all, for all of you Drumble uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. viewers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, there was, a, I think the first show I did that was like something to me was Kim Burrell when she came Ooh. to Berkeley. Like How old were you at the time? Ah, this, I had to be uh, between 19, 20, maybe, maybe closer to 21. Because I know the first big gig to me was when I started, I started playing with Marsha Ambrosius after Berkeley. Okay. So I was still in Boston getting ready to move here to Atlanta and Marsha Ambrosius from, I think I was 21, 22. Okay, wow. Sheesh, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So, uh, all right, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who are your biggest influences in terms of drums? Give me like five, five, like five drummers. Five. That's well, there's there's five. more than five. Yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, we gotta we gotta do Chumbadum. we gotta yeah. Um, so a heavy influence on my playing is uh, Dennis Chambers. I'm gonna put him out there. Go on ahead and just put him up there. Uh, for those of you who, who follow me, he's on my page. He came to a show last year with Mariah, so that was. Him and his wife, they got to see that in person. So that, that meant a lot. Um, from the crib, uh, one of my big, he's definitely like, I. people may not feel like I sound a little bit like him. I feel like I have a lot of him in my approach. Um, it's Robert Sputzy, right? Ooh, yeah. He's cold. He's so cold. He made that that version of Actual Proof oh, really? that I just played to. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, so Sput, okay. I got to put, that's two. two got to put my man Calvin Rogers out there. Of course. He's a heavy, yes. heavy influence. Yes, um, man, that's three, right? Mm -hmm. Four. I was. Ah, it was. Is, this is getting tough. <laughs> Mike Reed. Ooh, All day long. Love Mike. Um, man, there's so many people I want to name, bro. It. There's so many people I want to name. One more. <laughs> that's tough, man. Dang. You can leave, honestly, you can leave this last one open for just the- uh, I'm gonna say, I, and this might be a little different for most people, but mm. for number five, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say me. Okay. I, I wouldn't normally say that, but I, I look at myself as one day mm. being like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the professional gigs, but I look at myself in the category with those guys. Oh yeah, you definitely So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say sure. B. <laughs> I bet, that's the great answers right there. So here's a question I ask every drummer that comes on my show. The reason I ask it is, I just, I'm just curious. Yeah. What's your favorite rudiment? Okay. Oh, that's great. Um, and I'm gonna make you use it too, so get right. ready. No, yeah. I would say uh, a paradiddle diddle would probably be like, oh, paradiddle, like diddle. my favorite. I feel like everyone said a paradiddle. Yeah, now we have okay. something different. And then we already know, like, that's why Calvin. Yeah. <laughs> which is the reason, and Calvin, because of, you know, Vinny and, and Dave Weckle, but. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah like sure. that that pair that, that rudiment is my favorite. All right, bet. Can you play your groove and use it? Yep. We can see how you
That's tough. All right, one more use I want to see. Okay. Let's say you're in a gospel setting. Okay. Drum solo. How are you going to use that? In a gospel setting? Go ahead. I'm talking Tom's drum solo. Doom, 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 doom. Cut. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like it. Cold. That's so cold. Something like that. Yes, sir. I <laughs> bet. Hey, <laughs> you delivered for sure. All right, I got a, I got another question. Before I head into the questions that other people asked, okay. here's my last question. Okay. So, I remember you at a point on Instagram, okay. social media as a whole, yeah. you had a, a particular amount of followers, but then you grew real fast. Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna lie. I don't know what the time span was, yeah. but I remember I seen you. I can't remember how much you had, but just like that, you had a honey K. No, I can tell. I can tell you what happened. <laughs> tell us what happened because it was crazy. No, it's good. I can tell everybody what happened. Y'all consistency. Yes, sir. Consistent. I was just having. Uh, we did a Q and A or uh, before my brother Dion Kipping's uh, live recording last week. Mm. Last Friday, we went up to Berkeley. Okay. And uh, we were talking and I was talking about the importance now for us in this community right. uh, about social media. Exactly. And for me, I was I had 14.7 thousand mm -hmm. followers. Uh, I want to say that was in 2022. Wow. I want to say like January. Wow. And from Jeez. January, <clears throat> that was probably right at January 1. And so from January 1 till about uh, May 15th, I remember because myself and my wife, Lyric, we got married on the 15th. And I remember going from 14.7 to like 60,000 followers. And what it was is uh, we had just recorded the um, Black Music Honors and the Stella Awards. And all I did was post small clips. But what I did was post one video every day. One video every day. I had my captions typed up in my notes. And I would, uh, yeah, just I would copy and paste i may change a little bit of what i was saying for that day kept my hashtags the same um and just use the power of it like i posted one post every day wow. for six months straight and then i took a break around 60 to 65 thousand mm. and then i did it again at the top of 2023 <clears throat> and then last year when we got to may again by that time i had did 100k and but yeah i would say man a post a day um creates that ecosystem and i have to give a huge shout out to uh, j rod sullivan like mm. he was a big influence on doing it because i watched how he does it and and it's it's a business for him and the way he like moves and right. so i use it the same way that's it's true. like yo this is a business and i post more than just clips that are recorded but i also post stuff where it's just me playing and you know but yeah it's there for us to use so exactly you yeah utilize it it's, absolutely it's a big thing especially in our times right absolutely. now absolutely you think that changed a whole lot did you get like any type of you know gigs from that you know oh, people recognize man, you because i seen you you was at transformation recently too yeah, yeah. i was filling in over there for uh, for tony, tony. taylor sure. and um i mean you know instagram what i always like to say for this is it, instagram is your business card Right. However, relationships still run this game, no matter what. And just for all of you watching, like, have your following so people can go see and, and have your posts ready to go so people can see that you can handle anything. Mm -hmm. I think that's what my page shows. However, when you get in the rooms with the people, you still have to have a conversation. Right, you know right, what exactly. I'm saying? And yeah. and so I think you need both. I think you need both. However, I the one thing that I think it may have led to, but I don't think it was the determining factor. Matter of fact, I know it wasn't. Um, Terrence Vaughn, before he called me for Renee Rap, he saw videos from me playing the Stellar Awards. And then he reached out to uh, Dario Edgecombe, who plays bass on the Stellar Awards, but is amazing. Pianist, organist, all of it, Ox. I mean, he plays with us with Mariah on Ox, but then bass on the other show. So uh, he called him, Rick Watford, amazing guitarist again and Trent Phillips amazing organist oh, yeah. pianist producer 
uh, all of my big brothers, he called all of them inquiring about me. Wow. But I had the stuff on my page to where people could see like, no, nah, dude, can, he can handle it the stuff but then they called it and you know to get a valid uh recommendation but i think you need both man yeah for sure but i would say the renee rap thing might have been from from, from the power media? of social media That's but, awesome. but at the end of the day the relationship is still what kind of pushed it on through the door so. that's fine yeah. I, I knew you were coming to the show obviously so you know i was checking some videos out i'm gonna be real honest I personally didn't know Renee Rap yes. <clears throat> for the simple fact that I grew up in a gospel kind of home. You know, right. my dad's a pastor. Yeah. If I listen to, you know, any type of music that's like outside gospel, it's like rap. You know, right. sometimes. Right. But I checked uh I can't remember where you were. Did you play with her on uh it was a show y'all played on. Like Saturday Night Live? Yeah, y'all y'all yes. played on that? Yeah. yeah. So I saw that show and I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Renee is cold. No, like, she's cold. <laughs> she is. She's I, I hope cold. she sees this, but yeah. like, no, nah, Renee. Renee is cold, man, and yeah. and I think a lot of people find out more like when they come to those shows, because mm. uh, we came and did the Coca Cola Roxy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and but, bro, she's. Yeah, lyrics and everything. Mad dope. dope. No, she can go. That was amazing. Yeah. All right, gonna go ahead and ask you some questions from the people on Instagram. Okay. Not too. How 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 long are we? Oh, you don't have a timer, do you? It's probably been a little minute. All right, your first question is, what is your practice routine like, if you have any? That's a great question. Yeah. What is my practice routine? I feel like when y'all have played for so long, y'all are just so cold. Y'all don't even like really practice <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be that because I, I think that I practice differently now because I'm doing a lot of work rather than really? just playing. So I have this thing where um, um, that I'll definitely, you know, talk about more in the fill of a flash thing um, and go into that. But mm. I have this thing, man, where I listen to a song like five times and I feel okay. like you should be able to have it. Mm. I feel like the first first time is just listen through, you know, kind of like with no expectation. You just hearing the song for the first time. The second time you listen and then you try to hear what's going on with the drums. The third time you listen and what's going on with bass uh, and, the, and, and guitar and keys and that kind of stuff. The, the fourth time you listen through for the vocals and backgrounds and see what's there. And then the, and then the last time doing that again. Um, listening like you did the first time, but now that you've kind of sectioned off different things, now kind of place yourself in it. And I think by that, you should be able to pretty much have it. Um, there's some energy that's still attached to playing it through multiple times. But as far as listening, for me, my, yeah, that my routine is really, I'm, I'm, I do way more, I don't even, I don't even know what, what I would say, bro. I play the songs often. Okay. I play the songs often because I feel like, you know, for a drummer, when you want to work, you're going to be in a band setting nine times out of 10, unless you're doing a clinic or, or teaching. But outside of that, you're going to be playing in a band. Yeah. So what do I do? I play the like songs, I play the tracks. I take the time to see how, like, you know, what we're talking about with Avante how I can be musical in certain environments and what I would do differently each time. You know what I'm saying? But that's that's really how I would approach it. Um, yeah, but other than that, if they want to know deeper, then we can set up some uh, some uh, sessions or something. Oh yeah, we can do that for sure. All right, bet. Another question. How do you stay cool in high intensity moments? Stay cool. Like yeah, you all probably got a lot of those. Yeah, I, I, I really, and it's going to sound simple, but really breathing is a thing. Like even when I was playing um, Thank You at the, the top of this is remembering like sometimes while we're playing, like you kind of hold your breath. Mm. And that's a big thing, bro. That's to, true, like, yeah. That's true. Really like remind yourself to breathe because it's not like you're just holding tension. But you know how you... I think, it, and they're probably getting that in high intensity moments is like playing in front of certain size audiences right, right, right. and not getting nervous. Exactly. I, I go just as hard in those rehearsals as so that way when I get to the show, it's just like it's another just, run through. Nice. So that's how you can stay cool. It's like when I come to rehearsal, I'm playing it as if like I know, the, I know what we doing. Okay, and then when we get to the show, it's like, Same okay. thing. 
Yeah. Awesome. Same thing. It, it shouldn't be any different. Thanks. You know? That's what's yeah. up. All right. Easiest way to learn chops. Easiest way to Man. learn chops. I think that chops and another word for vocabulary comes from studying other drummers. I think that the more that you watch other drummers, mm -hmm. uh, specifically if this is for a drummer, but I mean, right, this could right. be for any instrument. Yeah. Watch the people who you like their sound. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I named some of my favorites because I didn't get a, no a long enough list other than five, <laughs> but like there's mad other drummers I, I listen to. Tyrone Turner Jr. Oh, he's, he's so phenomenal. Cool. CJ Thompson. Yeah. Uh, uh josiah like there's people out here that when i hear them play you know teddy campbell obviously uh stanley randolph like there's different people and i go to their stuff and i'm just like yo like this makes me feel good so then okay how do i apply it what is something that they would do and then see how they would do it understand why that works for them and then see how i can insert myself yeah got you that's good all right. Um, probably is probably gonna be the last question. Okay. It's a whole lot of questions, but I'll make this as short as possible so I can get you on your way. Oh, you good? All right. Cool. So, what are some of the biggest challenges you face as a drummer, and how have you? What? Oh, how did you overcome them? How did I overcome them? I think the biggest challenges, the biggest challenge that I faced, and I feel like I'm still facing, is not becoming complacent with being a drummer. I think. Um, as a musician, I was just talking about this last night with my wife, and I think that sometimes in this industry, how you walk in a door, people know you for that. Right. However, most of us do way more than one thing. I, I think the biggest challenge is, is, is always showing people more. And I think it's the key to that is being great here so that people then can will want to unlock the door to what else i do um that's been a huge challenge because i know i can produce i produce records I, i've produced records currently um i've i've programmed i've arranged i've done several things with different artists um but yeah it's it's always making sure that you know people see you in the light you want them to see you um and the way to do that is to is to be so great here that people want to know more. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think sure. that I've taken this so seriously to the point now where people are like, man, the way he approaches playing, he has to do something else or he thinking, his thinking is different, right? right? Yeah. So I would encourage people that first part of your gifting to take so seriously that people start to wonder like, well, what else is there? You know what I mean? So yeah, man, that, that's a huge challenge. And that's something that I feel like I'll always face um, as I keep moving in this life and accomplishing different things and even family stuff, having kids, yeah. the whole nine, it's always gonna be this sense of like, okay, I know that I'm more, but how do I show that? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, yeah, that that's always gonna be something, but yeah. That's been a big thing for me. You have kids? No, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. Okay. No, we're taking we're taking our time. <laughs> we are taking. But you our have time. a wife, right? Yeah. Okay. Last question: How do you deal? Because you tour a lot. Yes. You know, so how does that? How do you deal with that? You yeah. know. You know, you have to plan. You have to plan. Um, if it's a U.S. thing, it's easy for me to fly fly her in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if we're there for like, you know, I remember when I was out with Renee, Lyric came up. It was like the last week of tour. Uh, and we did like a, a whole run of shows in New York. Mm. We just fly her to New York and we just make it work. I mean, Lyric's an entertainer, artist, TV host, the whole nine on her own. So like she travels, we're both traveling a lot. So for us, it's different because it's not just like she's at home right, and right, I'm right, traveling. Right. It's like, no, nah, like okay. next month, we're going to be doing a yeah. bunch of that. So yeah. I think that it's just planning, you know, and, and being ahead of the curve, I think you know just, you know the saying you make time for you know things that you love and that you care about mm -hmm. so you just have to plan ahead and I, I would encourage that for anybody who is dating or married or have a, a serious relationship that your job keeps you moving right. often you know yeah, yeah man yeah, thank you so much for being here man on drum for having me bro yeah man it's so awesome to actually meet you and that crazy josh foster is on my kit <laughs> <laughs>
That's really wild. He has Bro. a really great kick here, too. <laughs> the man love the M's. Yes, sir. Yo, all right, so it's your boy Tim Ease. It's your boy jo Josh Foster. And I'm going to repeat that because I stuttered. <laughs> <laughs> it's your boy Tim Ease. It's your man Josh Foster. And this is Drumble in the drummer's hot seat. And we're out. Later. Later.